pleasure to uh, moderate this keynote session by Tami Bubeker, joint keynote session between HPG and EGSR. So a few words about Tami. Tami is a uh, lab director of the Adobe Lab and a principal research scientist uh, Adobe in Paris. He also is a professor of CS at Ecole Polytechnique, also in Paris. Um, Tami did his PhD with INRIA in France. Um, I think Bordeaux it was, not in my records. Correct, Bordeaux? Bordeaux, Bordeaux it was. Um, he moved on. He's been a postdoc at Berlin, which I rec receive you enjoyed a lot. So great that you had your share of Germany. Because then he founded the uh, computer graphics group in uh, Telecom Paris Tech in Paris, um, where also I had the pleasure of working with Elma there. So good times, so about 2010 that was. Okay, so uh, so much about that. And, and Tommy at the same time is a good friend. So I recently read this bio of Alexandre Dumas, and I, I, I read like he wrote like an unbelievable number of books. He traveled the world. He was a leading economical, political figure of his time. And Alexandre Dumas was also running a bar. So then I thought, oh, is it still possible in our times? And when I, th I thought about that, I thought, oh no, Tommy, Tommy is such a character, and uh, I'm very, pl very proud to have him here today and to know such a person. So, yeah, without further ado, there's Tommy. He already secured uh, his place in the Pantheon of Graphics in France and maybe everywhere. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias, for the, for the nice words. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, the, to the uh, organizers of HPG and HSR for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm happy to talk a little bit about the kind of research uh, I do and we do with my group today. And uh, let's start with the title, maybe, because I got a lot of questions about like, what this title means. Uh, does anyone know what multum in parvo means? Yeah? Exactly. It's a Latin expression to express that you have a lot of things in a small tile, basically. And that's what led to MIP, MIP, MIP mapping that we use everywhere in graphics today. So that was coined in the 80s by uh, Lance Williams, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this is a topic for today. And MIP mapping and all the related concepts, level of details, multi-resolution processing, multi-scale analysis, are the things I'd like to, to focus on. Usually when I make a talk, I pick up a research challenge and then I show how the recent research I've been doing come together into one single piece that address the challenge. Uh, this talk is a bit different. I will go over the recent work we did with my group, and I will try to show each time how we leverage MIP mapping, shape approximation, multi-resolution, multi-scale analysis to address the problem. So it's mostly an overview with some insight on the importance of those concepts. Before I start, I'd like to uh, list and remind that this is definitely not the, the work of one person, but of a large group of, of people, among which talented students and interns, uh, Mateus Gadela, Alban Gauthier, Émilie Guy, Thibault Lescoat, Hélène Legrand, Bei Shen Li, Corentin Mercier, Elie Michel, Liang Shi, Eric Trenley, and Tong Zhao. Uh, it has been a true pleasure to develop all those pro projects with them. Uh, at least one of them is here today. I hope some of them are online as well. A lot of Adobe researchers have been contributing to all those work. I won't list everyone. And we also engage with uh, the academic world and collaborate with faculty people. All right, so level of detail is a word I will use a lot today, as well as approximation in general. And this sequence is taken from one of our recent papers to just illustrate how much approximation models we leverage in graphics applications today. We have one for the shading model here, one for the illumination effect, one for ambient occlusion in screen space, one for the physics of uh, this animation where substitute coarse meshes are used instead of high resolution geometries to run this in real time. So I try to show that beyond speed and scalability, level of detail and shape approximation is a tool that is not only important, but also key and central to computer graphics research. A bit on, of context first. So I work at Adobe, and uh, most of our activities are orbiting around the 3D digital content creation pipeline, or DCC. Well, those notions are familiar to everyone here. The, the main breed of content that we manipulate are essentially 3D geometry, material models, and lighting conditions. And out of the three, we also provide, of course, all the services that you need to actually produce images out of this model. Now, of course, we have users that interact with those models, create them, manipulate them, edit them, assemble them into a current scene, 
And the more it goes, the more we see a hybrid creation mode where basically captured data is mixed with data that is designed by hand uh, in our tools to produce the final experience, whether it is an image or something more complicated. Now, level of details and approximation models are present everywhere in all those models and processes. And I will go over a few examples to show you how, how we use them. So in this talk, I will use uh, widely the, the term proxy. Uh, proxy to denote a particular level of detail. Proxy to denote how an approximation scheme takes place in an algorithm. Proxy also to denote the different levels of a MIP map hierarchy. Through the 3D DCC pipeline, I will try to address material and geometry as well as some element of a rendering. And I will mostly focus, of course, on uh, the work coming from our lab uh, with some perspective toward the end where I see opportunities for future research. And I took this image at the bottom to illustrate uh, this first this first part, uh, it's, a, it's an image taken from a, a work we did a couple of years ago called Bounding Proxies. It's a, it's a simplification of a mesh, but not a simplification meant to be uh, visually appealing or efficient at representing the appearance of the original object. It is meant to be conservative for any test you might have to do with the geometry. So bounding the original shape while being as tight as possible to it. So this is fairly far from a usual mesh simplification, what you see here, yet it serves other purpose than the final appearance of shapes. It serves physics simulation and freeform deformation needs. And this is what I observed over the last two decades, maybe. The fact that techniques that were developed for real-time rendering were actually finding use for other use cases beyond the pure image uh, synthesis process. OK, let's start with the case of materials. Obviously, I was before the chief scientist of Substance 3D at Algorithmic, and so materials have played a major role in our activities over the last few years. One challenge we had to address over the last five years, maybe, was to provide our users with the ability to create digital materials out of a single image. And that's the first example where we, where we used level of detail processing to actually achieve that. So the idea is that you take as input a photo uh, taken in the wild, so no flash, uh, you know, uh, grounds, uh, rock cliffs, anything that you can find outside, and you generate from it a digital material model in the form of a collection of maps that drive the reflectance properties of uh, your, your material as well as, uh, as well as some geometric component. And I will come back on the geometric component. We play a, a growing role in all those material models. So you can see here on the left the input, on the right what we obtain as output, and this is definitely an ill-pose problem. So this is a good reason to use uh, deep learning and neural nets to actually leverage the, the statistical domain of uh, a large collection of data that we have assembled for this purpose to solve the most ill post part. And this ill post part essentially relies on two aspects. First, light plays a major role in what we perceive from the material and is actually making the task difficult when you try to reverse engineer albedo, roughness, normals, and so on. So the first task we really tried to address was to delight the input photo, while accounting for what made actually the technology interesting, which is its ability to capture not only microstructures, but also mesostructures, things which are a little bit bigger than a few pixels. The second task, which kickstarts the geometric part of the pipeline, is essentially to reconstruct a normal map out of this measurement, and for that we use a second, a second uh, neural model. Now, if you take those two models, which are actually units, which are trained on a, a custom synthetic data set, uh, you, you get results that works well at fine scale. But it's extremely hard to actually, actually reconstruct the mesostructure uh, at, at large scale. So we combine it with a two-scale scheme, where basically the same model is used to reconstitute the geometry at different scales at the same time. We don't have multiple models. We have a single one that is itself actually hierarchical. And then we run it at multiple scale on the input image so that we bring coherency in the reconstructing maps. One decision we made here was that uh, we wanted to have the capacity of the model and essentially the, the power of your GPU and the, the amount of memory available on a GPU dedicated to the most ill-posed tasks. So only the lighting and normals are actually reconstructed this way. And we combine it with a bunch of other algorithms to extract the, the remaining channels to obtain in the end such a material. So <coughs> again, same example as before with uh, the albedo map, the normal map that are extracted from this neural process, as well as roughness and eight, eight map that are extracted through additional algorithm following the neural processing. Now, you can see that it works fairly well, even if 
the material is not really a material, and that's something we had to cope with. Uh, what we call material in research might sometimes be pretty far from what a final user calls material. I recall when I was a student, uh, and when I saw listed among the SVBRDF maps the normal map, I was a bit shocked. For me, the normal had nothing to do with reflectance. It was part of the geometry and shouldn't be part of a SVBRDF model. As a matter of fact, not only the normal map, but also the displacement map and other things which are related to geometry are actually having a lot of success being understood and used as channels of the digital material model that people use. And that's something that motivated a bunch of uh, following work that I will describe uh, a little bit later. Now, some, some first observations here. Uh, we have an explicit neural model where we explicitly feed uh, the model with multi-scale data so that it can reconstruct both micro and meso de details. Uh, the geometry that it extracts made it successful. In practice, this is, shipping, this is shipping in two products at Adobe, Adobe Capture and Adobe Substance, and uh, the feedback has been, uh, has been great so far. Uh, one interesting aspect is that uh, the model can be extended to multiple scales. I only showed here the use with two scales, and in practice, that was enough. So I won't be extreme in the multi-scale uh, you know, uh, discussion. Sometimes, and actually very often, two or three scales are enough. And that's also something I'd like to discuss toward the end of this presentation. Now, this was a simple example to, to kickstart the, the keynote. The, the juice of what we do at Substance is definitely not about uh, static materials, but dynamic ones. So let me now move to what we call parametric materials. What you see here is actually one asset. The geometry of this asset and the materials of this asset are actually unique. And what we have here is actually variations over the hyperparameters of the parametric material and geometry that compose this scene. This is uh, an emerging workflow where you try, you, you try to avoid creating content which is purely static and let a few degrees of freedom so that the amount of work you put into creating one scene can actually lead to hundreds of different scenes by just exposing a few high-level parameters. So if we, if we go back to the specific case of materials, so far I've been discussing materials as a SVBRDF composed of multiple maps that model, again, reflectance and geometry of the material. And now I'm transitioning to materials expressed as programs, as directed acyclic graphs, which are essentially the modern form of procedural textures. Only the procedural aspect is, just, is not just a noise function or some filter. It's an entire graph of operators that defines the signal over the UV domain. Uh, just so that we are all on the same page, let me quickly go over what is a material program today. So as I said before, it's a direct it's a directed acyclic graph made of nodes and edges. The nodes are typically of three kinds. Generators that create actually content in the UV space. Filters, which have to be understood in their most general form. They take as input textures, produce as output textures. And data stores, because the more it goes, the more you see hybrid uh, materials, where part of the material is actually, is actually coming from the capture process, and another part is coming from the proceduralization of the content. Now, what exists on the edge are actually the, a, a flow of maps that feed a particular material model, typically a microfacet model uh, driven by the GG, GGX NDF. And for that, the typical output of this graph are the albedo, roughness, conductivity, normal, or 8 map, up to many more channels in the modern uh, shading models, but uh, let's just uh, stick to, to those one. One aspect which is interesting with those materials is that they run entirely on GPU, which means that the synthesis of those maps never go over the CPU to then go back to the GPU. Everything is done live on the GPU, which means that even at high resolution, you can edit and control in real time this content. And this is what makes that kind of engine successful. Uh, I'm describing here, of course, the, the Substance engine, but other engines are also uh, working this way. Now, I will focus on materials, but the same is true for shapes and lighting environments. So what's the, the actual benefit of all of that? Well, it's resolution infinite. You can expose a few hyperparameters that drastically change the content of your material. The term material becomes much wider when you uh, create content this way. Uh, you can see at the bottom what a given material gives when it's applied on just two triangles, right? Those wheels are made of two triangles, texture map with the output of a material graph that has a rich geometric mesostructure, as well as a rich opacity map. 
So you can see the appeal that this represents, for instance, for real-time applications, where in the end, most of the geometric content lives in the material maps, which is easy to tile, filter, stream, uh, and make level of detail of. Now, of course, uh, the first project I was mentioning was about capture. This one is about designing material graphs. Can we bridge the two worlds? Can we actually capture material graphs? And that was the topic of a fairly large project that we had uh, three years ago called Match, where the challenge was to actually, given an input photo, as before, be able to obtain a material graph that would reproduce it. Um, it was a challenge in the sense that uh, what has to be optimized is actually a, a program, like you know, any DAG is actually a program, and that's particularly, particularly true for, for materials. And you can see here a few examples of what we obtained. It's essentially, it's essentially a, a two-stage process where you first seek for a material graph in a database that could, under some variation, match to your input image before optimizing the parameters of this graph so that you you finally, uh, you finally obtain uh, details, colors, normals, roughness that corresponds to the, the appearance of the input photo. So you see on the left each time the initial graph that was retrieved and in the middle after optimization what we obtain. Now there are two parts in match but really the important one, the one that makes it useful for the subsequent project is the, is the one that optimizes the parameters. The key idea at that time, which is now actually used in many other projects, is that we can use the mechanism of, this, of deep learning but through a different object than a neural net. And in particular, what we do in practice is that we back propagate from the image through the graph to optimize all the parameters of our material graph exactly the same way as you back propagate uh, from a given loss or the gradient of the loss uh, toward, uh, through, through a neural net in traditional machine learning. So that proved to be uh, fairly successful and when it comes to level of details, I think it's it's an interesting approximation scheme because this is an approximation scheme, although you may have extremely sharp features, very detailed content, but the approximation does not lie in the L2 sense. What we use to actually match images with the output of our graph is a style loss. So the style loss will make sure that statistically over a small window, similar structures are recovered. But you cannot guarantee that you will have the exact same grain or the exact same features as the one uh, present in the input image. That was uh, actually a, a challenge to get something that, that would be stable enough, but in the end, for many, for many application scenarios, the byproduct of this process is that although you may not have exactly the material that you wanted first, what you have is something which is resolution infinite. And that has a lot of value in practice. Of course, the material remains editable. You can manipulate the, the, the various uh, hyperparameters that are attached to the material. And, and that's a practical concern for many users, uh, tileable. Tileability of a material uh, sample is actually a, a deciding factor between using it or not using it in production, uh, in many cases. So the notion of approximation with match lies in the detail color spectrum, not in the features. You won't get blurry results, but you might get something which is slightly off in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the structure of the micro details and the meso details. And of course, the whole process is bounded to the maximum expressiveness of the set of graphs you were first uh, searching from. Therefore, why not move into the next step, which is synthesizing the graph explicitly? Well, that's a much more complicated problem. It's related to program synthesis, and we actually tackled part of it with another project called Matformer. So Matformer is a generative model that essentially generates material graphs uh, after a training of a, large of a large collection of procedural ones. So you can see here a few, uh, a few examples of uh, what this uh, generative model produces. It produces graphs which are very similar to the one we use every day with our uh, material suite. And it provides also, uh, uh, beyond the generative aspect, a few useful applications such as graph autocompletion. Like if you start to make a graph by yourself, you can use Matformer to complete it. How does it work? Uh, essentially, a graph, a material graph, may have long-range dependencies between the different nodes that compose it. So transformers appear to be uh, the right tool to actually predict what could be the structure and the values of, uh, of a material graph. In practice, Matformer is actually a, a triplet of uh, three transformers, one that predicts nodes, one that predicts the values of, uh, contained in the parameters of the nodes, and one that predicts the edges among the nodes. As a result, 
you get a generative model that, then get, that can generate an infinity of uh, material graph, which are all fully editable, titleable, because that was a property shared by many of the graphs uh, we trained from. And that can be used to create content, but also to uh, perform the last miles of the material creation process, where the initial structure of the material is designed by a user, and then the rest of the graph, which can contain up to hundreds and hundreds of nodes, is actually synthesized. Now, let me switch gears and discuss similar notions, approximation level of details and multiscale processing, but in the context of geometry and, and shapes, essentially. So a lot of work has been done in the community uh, regarding this aspect, whether regarding geometry processing purely, geometry analysis, or freeform modeling. Level of detail and shape approximation models have been used uh, at every stage. Let me just put a little bit of context here. Uh, in the content creation pipeline, when we start to use capture data, it always starts by assembling together uh, point clouds so that once registered, the point clouds can lead to an input to a reconstruction algorithm. This reconstruction algorithm is typically meant to generate a surface out of the point cloud and then start the traditional computer graphics task where you simplify, compute the UV map, subdivide, remesh, animate, skin, and so on and so forth. But the initial step is ready to go from capture, measure data, to a surface model. Now, there is a standard algorithm for that, uh, one that is very successful. And when I was uh, younger, I've been studying this algorithm quite a lot. That's Poisson surface reconstruction. I'm pretty sure many of you know this algorithm. It has been uh, really an enabler for all our friends in computer vision to actually get good meshes out of 3D measurements. This algorithm is essentially uh, estimating estimating a gradient on the, of, a, of an indicator function, which is essentially a function in space that tells you whether you are in the reconstructed shape or outside. And solving for a Poisson system that essentially associates the, the divergence of the, of the normal field of your point cloud with the Laplacian of this indicator function, you reconstruct a, a, a surface mesh. The surface mesh is actually extracted with a marching cube uh, at the very end of the process. Now, <coughs> One pitfall of uh, the traditional way of doing surface reconstruction is that you need to discretize the space to solve a system at some point. And the only cue you have to discretize the space is to actually look at where the points were uh, initially and then uh, try to make sure that you have a partition of the space that account for their presence. Now, if you do surface reconstruction, that happens often that part of the surface re you reconstruct is actually far away from the points. That's actually the main interest in powerful surface reconstruction algorithm to reconstruct uh, large holes and uh, you know, field space where you had actually no data with something reasonable. So there are two ways of discretizing space, uh, using an arc tree typically, that was in the original paper, or using a, a tetraidization, a donated tetraidization of the, of the space. And in both cases, the initial discretization is often suboptimal. And it leads to wrong assumption about where the surface should go and wrong level of detail in the way you solve the system and provide degrees of freedom to the final surface. And you can see here many artifacts that stem from uh, such examples. So we adopted a progressive approach, which is, again, another mechanism that comes from multi-scale processing, to try not only to reconstruct a surface, but also to reconstruct the right discretization of the domain. That's why, it, that's why it's called progress, progressive discrete domains, where in an iterative process, we not only reconstruct a surface, we actually progressively improve the discretization of space that led to the surface. So think about it as an interactive algorithm where each step is actually a Poisson surface reconstruction, and in between, we interleave an optimization of the discretization of the space. You can see multiple steps of this process, and this gives actually a fairly good results in challenging cases where a lot of data is missing for large holes or spiky features. Now, this is one extreme of a spectrum. Like, this is a slow algorithm in practice. I think about like tens and tens of iteration of the Poisson surface reconstruction, which is itself a fairly slow process. There are other ways to reconstruct a surface, and one of them is uh, to use another family of reconstruction mechanism called moving least squares, or MLS. Moving least squares surfaces live at another extreme. They do not need any system solving. They can work locally independently of uh, when you reconstruct many points, they can be independently reconstructed uh, all in parallel. And uh, they are very versatile. Versatile, So you can adapt it to the amount of data you have uh, available. You can adapt it to the kind of features that exist on your point set uh, in the input. And although they are extremely fast, they support from something that uh, is a showstopper for many applications, which is a local support nature. 
It means that the geometry you reconstruct will only account for the neighboring sample point that you had in the input. So that's why we tackle uh, this problem with something that we call last year moving level of detail surfaces. The idea was theoretically you can express an MLS surface with a global support, avoiding all the pitfalls of local support, no hole, no discrepancy, something extremely smooth, even at very large scale. In practice, it's impossible to use because think about a million points as input, evaluating the function of, that defines this surface at a given location in space would be in big O of n at best. So no way to use that, that's why people rely on the k nearest neighbors, and we found a way to actually uh, combine the benefit of both, the speed of local schemes with the quality of global, of global schemes, all of that thanks to level of details. And in a nutshell, I will try to explain quickly how this works. So a moving least wear surface is expressed as the fixed point of a projection operator, which means that if I apply the operator in space and I do not move by applying it, I am on the surface. That's the definition of an MLS surface. And when you evaluate it in space, what you usually do is that you, you're going to wait, you're going to center a weighting kernel at the evaluation location and then weight all the input samples with this uh, weighting kernel. Based on this weighting, you're going to fit a geometry primitive and that's going to be the support onto which you will project the space. Uh, this is where the, the performance issue lies. If you want to be robust to large holes, you have to collect a lot of neighbors to actually, uh, before actually fitting your geometry primitive, and that's intractable in practice. So that's why people typically use K and N instead of the wall P as input, and this leads to poor quality. And that's here that kickstart our ID. Instead of weighting the entire point cloud with uh, a weighting kernel, what we do is that we, do, we compute an X-dependent level of detail of the entire point cloud before actually doing the fitting process. In other words, for the rendering people in the room, that's applying the principle of light cuts, but to the MLS evaluation problem, where we gather an approximation that is evaluation dependent of the wall geometry before uh, proceeding with the, the actual projection. And you can see on the right something we obtained almost in real time, where we browse the different scales at which we can reconstruct the surface up to very fine detail with a quality that almost match Poisson surface reconstruction at a speed that is comparable to local uh, MLS schemes. So we applied it on a, on a bunch of, uh, of schemes. One, one scheme that is extremely efficient with it is the algebraic point set surface model introduced by Genevo and colleague in 2007, where the geometric primitive you fit is actually an algebraic sphere. Now, I, I was just talking about, you know, reconstructing a shape by approximating locally it with a geometric primitive, a plane, an algebraic sphere, or something like that. There is a task in graphics that has been around for 30 years, like between graphics and vision, which is actually recognizing such shapes in 3D data. Like, how do you recognize that a complex object is made of a few simple ones? Simple being cylinders, cones, spheres, cube. Uh, this is a very ill-posed problem, and uh, a problem for which solutions very often do not scale extremely well. Uh, we, we actually worked on that and again applied a multi-scale and level of detail scheme to try to address this challenge with something called CPFM, so Cascaded Primitive Fitting Network, where we essentially started from the state of the art in this field, which was a recent neural method that would essentially detect a simple primitive out of a few tens of thousands of points. And we tried to derive a multi-scale approach out of it. So if you take this, this object here on the left, ideally you'd like to decompose it into a couple of cylinders and a plane, mostly. And if you do that, you solve a lot of problems on the way. Like part of the surface reconstruction problem is solved. A lot of application can work directly with the fitted primitive instead of the original data. It's, it's an interesting output to obtain. Our architecture works at two scales. Again, two scales, N not more. A fine scale where basically we run the neural model locally so that we detect for a small set of points what would be the set of primitives that would explain it the best. And we do pretty much the same at a global scale where we subsample the entire point cloud and then try to find a set of primitives that explain this subsampling. Then the idea is to find uh, an agreement between the two sets of primitives so that in the end we extract a meaningful set of primitives that covers both small features and large structures. And this is what we obtain here. Uh, it was a step forward, but I have to say we, we still have a lot of work to do to make it really scale to large amounts of data we gain maybe an order of magnitude compared to a previous state of the art, and we are still actively working on this particular task, which is both um, simple to state, but actually fairly hard to, to address. 
Now, you can go a step further and try to rely entirely on learning, not seeing learning as a way to filter data or fit primitives, but as a way to actually express your approximation. This is another direction that we've been following uh, pretty much at the same period of time by studying and developing generative 3D proxy models. So a generative model whose task is to, is to actually approximate a given shape. And we did that with a, a specific neural architecture that on one side um, employ a fairly simple generator, actually the simplest you can come up with, which is a variational autoencoder. Well, nowadays, I mean, it's three years old, so it's very old by deep learning standard. Uh, nowadays, we would probably revisit that with a diffusion model, typically, but it doesn't change the, the basic principle where when we try to approximate a shape with a, a small set of primitives, we work in two stages. We first try to predict the existence of a given primitive before predicting the parameters of this uh, particular primitive. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit of a twisted way of thinking about uh, primitive fitting because predicting the existence of something while you're actually computing might sound exotic. But in practice, it allows to vectorize the problem so that we would actually be compatible with uh, generative models which have like a fixed size input and a fixed size output, something that you don't know when you start uh, analyzing a shape. So we did that with uh, supervised uh, data, but also with a kind of self-supervision using an automatic uh, shape approximation algorithm. And it gives rise to an interesting latent spaces. An interesting, you know, the, the set of shapes you can query from this generator are actually uh, maybe good candidates to manipulate the shape at core scale. Uh, I will transition to that in a second, but the original idea of this project was not to generate a, a replacement for the object, but a set of handles, hence the, the name of the paper actually, generative handles, handles that would allow you to manipulate the shape interactively without av having to build yourself uh, cages, skeletons, or a set of key points on the surface. This presentation is an overview of all those, uh, those projects, so let me uh, move forward with another aspect of the 3D DCC pipeline where the notion of scale has been critical. And we just move a little bit further in the, in the creation pipeline toward the editing phase where the user is meant to interact with uh, the 3D content. Uh, two years ago, we introduced something called DAG amendments to manipulate parametric shape interactively in a WYSIWYG fashion. And the idea was that given a parametric shape with a set of hyperparameters, how can I translate the simple user input of clicking somewhere and dragging into an update of the exposed and available hyperparameters. The idea was to make interaction with those graph-based shapes as simple as when you manipulate a mesh or an implicit surface uh, on screen. Now, I, I won't have time to describe in detail the whole system, but there was one key feature in, uh, in, this, uh, in this system that involved the, the scale analysis, which is that it is, again, an ill posed problem. If I only prescribe one point on a surface and prescribe a translation of this point into the R3D space, there are multiple modifications of the hyperparameter set that could explain this transformation. Instead, what we did was to enrich the input of the user with the notion of scale. So typically in this example here, the user will not only define uh, what's the size of a, uh, what's the position of an interaction with the shape, but also at which scale the, the interaction should occur. This allows to distinguish the, the small knob from the drawer itself from an entire door by just changing the scale at which the interaction is meant to be expressed. In practice, this allows also to have a more stable differentiation of uh, the, the world graph so that we can update uh, the parameters. You can see here that it gives rise to a fairly natural way of interacting with shape just by adding this notion of scale at which one wants to interact, where you can grab things like holes in a geometry and move it. I mean, moving a hole, so moving emptiness in a 3D shape is actually challenging because this involves things that you cannot differentiate, for instance, with uh, Boolean operations. Still, in practice, it works because we do not have only one point. We have a point and enti an entire scale around it to interact with the shape. Last, for the modeling part, before transitioning to rendering, uh, th there is another aspect of our work whose sole purpose is to actually establish a dialogue between different scales of the same shape. Uh, this topic is called uh, cage coordinate or space coordinates. That's something onto which we have invested a lot with my team over the years, for, for 15 years now. And that allows essentially to build a level of detail of a shape while maintaining a relationship to this shape. Uh, in other words, you can 
transfer edits and deformations and diffuse from the low resolution version of your shape toward the high resolution version one. Uh, this is known also as, like this problem is known also as a generalization of barycentric coordinate problem. Uh, you know, you're all familiar with barycentric coordinate on a triangle, mean value coordinate generalize that somehow to volumes bounded by uh, a surface, a, a triangle mesh as, a, as the boundary. And we developed over the years many schemes to actually uh, be able to express what would happen on the coarse simplification of a shape back to the original full resolution object. So that's what you see here. The user essentially interacts with the blue cage that is encompassing this car. And then the deformation is transferred only through coordinate reprojection to the original shape. Now, if you design your coordinate set well, it can come with fairly interesting properties, such as this work from SIGGRAPH last year called uh, quad green coordinates, where the deformation that occurs when you start transferring from the coarse to the high resolution model is what's called quasi-conformal, which means that locally the volume will be preserved. That's a property that is extremely interesting for natural interaction with, uh, with shape. Now, considering the audience, I couldn't conclude with something else than image synthesis. And let me uh, transition to the last part of this talk uh, about rendering, essentially, and some aspect of rendering which is related to what I was talking first. So there is one question after which we come back on a regular basis with my team, which is, where should we locate the geometric representation? Like, some people consider that a super high resolution mesh with vertex color, for instance, should, or vertex attribute, should be enough for pretty much any application we, we target. Some others are uh, extremely fan of texture mapping with uh, all the benefit of having mappable, tileable, random accessible content expressed as 2D maps that exist in the UV space. And they believe that a good system should be able to handle both. But what's sure is that level of detail and mip mapping is almost for free, not exactly for free, uh, I have a last project to mention, but almost for free, when you deal with 2D maps. And if we can express a large part of the geometric content of a shape in its 2D maps, let's say displacement, normal map, uh, it's a big win, not only for uh, editing, but also for final usage of the, of the content. So let me focus on one aspect of it, which is the 8 map or displacement map, if you want. This is where you can locate really 95% of the geometric content of a complex asset, because as a 2D high resolution map, it can encode a large part of the geometric features of a shape, and you, you can be left with a fairly coarse domain to manipulate in 3D actually. So we studied displacement mapping, and back then we were interested in uh, having super high quality displacement mapping, but in our GPU path tracer that we are developing at Adobe. And there was one, one challenge with that, which was the resolution with which our users were producing displacement maps. So in practice, those displacement maps exi exist at least at 4K resolution. And sometimes they are tiled 10 times. So the, this visualization of the displacement map is not really reflecting the complexity of it. The amount of detail that exists in this dis displacement map gives rise to the, the appearance that you see on the right. And it's not only about moving the geometry, it's about creating entire new light paths on the surface with shadowing effect and occlusions that either reveal or hide details and give this crisp, this crisp uh, appearance that is appealing to, for, for many users. So you can see here, with and without displacement mapping, and with the exact same rendering algorithm in the end, a GPU pass tracer, a Monte Carlo pass tracer, and uh, you see the benefit of reproducing them well. Now, as I was saying, those things are super high resolution. And uh, if you try to go the usual way and tessellate your mesh before building a BVH and then ray tracing that, very quickly you run out of memory, in particular when people tile stuff. I know I already talked about tiling, but believe me, this is like one of those things that break algorithm in practice in production that were perfectly working as long as tiling was not part of the game and that is actually so important for users, being able to tile content. This is very often how you expand the content that you created to entire worlds. So <coughs> we came up with a solution called TFDM, or Tessellation Free Displacement Mapping, that essentially avoid any tessellation. And we did that by reversing a little bit the process. So you can see here the geometry of a, a simple 3D scene with like two triangles for the ground, a simple cylinder and two planes. And you can see the, the resulting rendering that you get with uh, TFDM and all the details that comes from the displacement map. The idea here was that instead of tessellating the base geometry before displacing it, what we would do would be to build the acceleration data structure in the texture space and then texture map 
the data structure on the core surface at rendering time. As a matter of fact, what it provides is that you have a per ray level of detail that is synthesized on the fly while, while tracing, and that can be done up to the resolution of the text cell that you had in your displacement map, and independently of the amount of tiling, for instance, that you had on the surface. So here is an example of what you typically get with equivalent budget when you first test late and then displace, then build your BVH and render, and when you use TFDM for the exact same task. So the benefit here is mostly on quality and memory consumption. In terms of speed, it remains an order of magnitude slower than uh, scenarios where you can actually build the BVH and where all of that fit in memory. But there is one scenario super important for us where that kind of solution is the only way to go. That's when the actual content of the displacement map is designed. As I said at the beginning, we work mostly for the 3D DCC pipeline where displacement mapping is not something that is fixed and then used on screen. It's actually something that people create while using our technologies. So one last aspect of it is that maybe on the contrary to neural alternatives, we have also colleagues working on neural alternatives to that kind of process, the only thing that we replace fundamentally is the uh, intersection test. So your shading model remains preserved, and you can use it as usual in your pipeline. Uh, it's compatible with uh, real-time editing for procedural content and parametric materials, as I was mentioning before. And here are a few examples of uh, result we get with this, uh, with this technique on uh, non-trivial displacement maps. As a side note, uh, many of our users are abusing displacement maps together with normal maps, and that also inspires us in pushing in this direction because we see that as soon as we provide them with powerful and efficient displacement mechanisms, they can do really crazy things. So, low memory footprint runs entirely on the GPU and is uh, well adapted for uh, content editing when it comes to the, the displacement part of the, the displacement part, sorry, of the material model. Now, recently we had to address another problem uh, with actually Alban, who's, who's here somewhere, which relates to two other maps uh, present in the material model that we manipulate, uh, the roughness and normal. Maybe some of you are familiar with the, the term in industry called uh, roughness to normal transfer or normal to roughness transfer. Um, this arises typically when you try to meet map material models, where part of what was the mesostructure present in the normal map should now be expressed at a given MIP level in the roughness map. We came up with a solution called uh, MIPNet, which uh, we designed so that it could work with multiple shading models, and in particular, multiple microfacet NDFs. Uh, we experimented extensively with uh, GGX and Beckman, and found that the same neural architecture, the same neural filter, can, uh, with, with different weights, of course, can be used to actually downsample efficiently uh, normal and uh, roughness map. On the way, one, one specific aspect we focused on was the emergence of anisotropic roughness. Like typically, the distribution of normal and roughness value at, for a given patch on your material at a given scale might quickly become something extremely anisotropic. And you, detecting that and giving rise to this in, among the MIPS uh, was actually a challenge. We solved it by expressing it through a tensor, and actually what we somehow MIP map is a tensor, uh, that express the anisotropy of the material regarding its meso and micro uh, geometric structure. So this is the minimal architecture that was convincing. Two neural models, HA and HB, that are trained using a, a small differentiable uh, rendering engine to downsample the material maps and transfer content from the normal to the roughness, to the anisotropic roughness one. Why two models? Well, one model kicks HA here is a multilayer perceptron that kickstart the process, but only see two scales, very hard over four pixels to actually detect anisotropy. The second one, HB, actually has view on an extra scale that it makes the task of giving uh, birth to anisotropy much easier than uh, with a single model. Of course, we could think about like using more model, like HC, HD, to have larger and larger footprint and you know, uh, more vision over the different scales. But it turns out that it was enough to achieve uh, good results in uh, many practical scenarios. So in the end, it's a, it's a simple neural MIP map filter that does not involve any additional maps in your material model. Uh, for production reason, that was also an interesting aspect. Like you can use, use it just as a drop-in replacement for your uh, favorite MIP map generation primitives. And it can be used in two modalities, either in its generalized form that was trained on a thousand materials, or when overfitting 
uh, albeit with a lot of a lot more computation for a single material when you want to maximize quality. And you can see here a few a few examples. All right, let me conclude. I've been trying to show you that across the DCC pipeline, the 3D DCC pipeline, level of details, approximation scheme, and multi-scale processing were, were, were play a, playing actually a, a major role. And that's my you know, take-home message uh, for today. Uh, level of details are everywhere and extremely interesting to study. That being said, I have the, the feeling that uh, there is untapped potential in many aspects of computer graphics that have not been Meet mapped yet. And if you're looking for direction to explore, I would uh, encourage you to look into whatever happens in your pipeline, in your algorithm, in your process, other aspects of it that could benefit from a MIP mapping level of detail or approximation scheme. Another aspect that, that explains why I chose this topic for this talk, I, I have currently three, three slide decks so on different topics, but I, I picked up this one for, for this one uh, joint keynote, is that Level of detail and MIP mapping, multi-resolution processing and multi-scale analysis is pretty core to computer graphics science. We borrow, in computer graphics, we borrow a lot of notions from our friends in applied mathematics, signal processing, physics, biology, but preserving the appearance of a shape, building level of detail, efficient MIP maps on the GPU for geometry, light, material is something which is really core to this community and that's there is a potential to disseminate some of our methodology to other sciences as well. I had a chance to work uh, a little bit over the years in biomedical engineering using graphics techniques that we developed for graphics purpose, but with another impact, another, another kind of outcome than the final image that we use in game and, and VFX. Interestingly also, these methods help establishing a dialogue with the other sciences. The example of the end-body problem, I'm sure some of you have worked on simulating an in the end-body problem uh, on a GPU, for instance, has created a lot of interaction between graphics and physics. And this happens in many other fields, including uh, material representation, the microfacet theory, and so on. Today, I presented only a fraction of the work we do in this space. If you're interested in more, uh, either regarding global illumination, granular rendering, uh, registration, 3D printing, and even HDR relating, please have a look to my, to my web page. I will conclude with three, three remarks, and I will uh, resurrect an old piece of work for the first one. Uh, the byproduct of approximation. This is an example of a simplification algorithm we designed about 10 years ago. The goal of the algorithm was to simplify a shape at extreme coarse levels. Doing so, we realized at some point that polygons, which are essentially two-dimensional two elements, were not enough to capture with a small amount of numbers a complex shape. So the idea we had with Jean-Marc Thierry and Emily Guy, two, two of my students back then, was to increase the dimensionality of our mesh with one dimension that would be the thickness, hence those spheres, which are actually vertices in four dimensions. Long story short, this is a simplification algorithm that was not meant to discover that this shape was made of four spheres, but that consistently performed extremely well at discovering simple geometric primitives in complex shapes. So we were not trying to target shape approximation with simple primitives, but as a byproduct of an efficient simplification mechanism that was meant to be level of details, we got something that actually beats most of the uh, simple shape detectors uh, out there. And the second notion I'd like to point is that, of course, I tried to steer you away from the obvious main benefit of level of detail, which is speed and, and scalability. Of course, this is the, the main reason why we usually use level of detail, mean maps, and so on. And if you push it far enough, uh, you get something like what we presented at HPG actually eight years ago. Uh, so think about the eight years old GPU and the problem of creating a, a simplification of a mesh. Here, 11 million triangles as input, 64,000 triangles as output, all of that in 46 milliseconds. When you design properly that kind of level of detail algorithms, somehow some geometric processing primitives are not pre-processing anymore. They can be processed that can be executed on the fly, which means that something that used to be something that you, you know, execute first, then store on disk, then reuse at some point, can be seen as just an, an, interf uh, an access interface. Uh, think about generating as many simplification of a mesh as you have frame in a sequence of a real-time application. This is actually possible with a high-performance level of details method. Last, and that's to, to call a, a recent piece of work which is definitely not from us, but that I find extremely inspiring, uh, Monte Carlo Geometry Processing. Maybe you heard about this paper uh, three years ago at SIGGRAPH by uh, Sonny and Crane. Um, I think 
this approach to geometry processing opens up what used to be a black box for many researchers. Geometry, pro re geometry processing is often cast as the formalization of a system of equation and then the solving of the system. And the solving is often done with something which is a black box because most graphics researchers do not dig into the solver themselves to modify it for a particular execution scheme. Now, this is a much simpler approach that takes inspiration from Monte Carlo rendering, where everything is open. It's, uh, it's not a black box, it's extremely easy to get into the actual uh, solver, this Monte Carlo solver, and bring pieces from our expertise, level of details, approximation scheme, multi-resolution schemes. And so, if you, like me, lie at the frontier between rendering and modeling, I think that this line of work is extremely interesting. I made a lot of effort to split my presentation into multiple components with material on one side, geometry on the other. Uh, this is both interesting and also a curse. Uh, if I show you those three pictures, maybe some of you would talk about materials, some others would talk about geometry. It really depends on you know, your current activities and uh, the, the kind of things you, you like to do in computer graphics. I would say that on the long run, uh, one of the objectives we will pursue will be to unify that and maybe stop having this split between how we represent appearance and how we represent shapes. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. Thank you for the fantastic talk, Tommy. Fantastic. Are there questions to Tommy at this point? Yeah, thanks. Fantastic talk. Um, I just a quick question. Where you were showing the car animation with the low, the low cage over that, as an old timer, what what's the difference between that and like the ancient freeform deformation um, operations? So the uh, the ninety eighty six Seagraph paper that described lattice deformation is using three D lattice. So you have a regular three D grid, and you can move like every vertices inside, and you get some local linear model that transfer the, the deformation to the uh, to the volume, hence the high resolution mesh. What I sh in what I showed, this is what we call cage coordinates, where basically every point is in space is expressed as a set of coordinates that relate to all the vertices of the cage. That means that. Uh, First of all, you have as many coordinates as you have points in the control mesh. So that's, a, that's a pitfall. But on the other side, you have long range effect and volume deformations uh, behavior that are much better than uh, when you just locally modify the, uh, the, the, the vertices of a lattice in a freeform deformation. I can take, like, I can take a very simple example. If you, the, for the model we studied the, and introduced uh, for quads, the green coordinate model that was originally introduced by Lippmann, you can create rotations out of cage vertex translations. That kind of behavior uh, is impossible to do with linear models. Oh, I, I thought the freeform deformation was like a, a, a cubic or something like that. But yeah, even though it's a linear relationship between the space deformation and the vertice, vertices that you move. Okay. Right. Thank you. There's another question up there, please. <sighs> Run with I can throw that part. There's somewhere we're going to get this. All right. So I. So, oh yeah. So I. So I'm. <clears throat> so of course I've seen that you have dealt with. So you thought you know with like have that 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 displacement mapping, where you know where you have. So. I'm thinking, how much have you looked into combining it with Fong tessellation, where, the dis where it's a Fong tessellation that you're displacing, or this quadratic Bezier patches that are being displaced? Uh, we, we looked into not specifically Fong tessellation, but in general uh, subdivision substitutes. One thing we had in mind at some point was to um, bake in the Fong displacement, for instance, yeah. with the actual displacement map into a single model that would both smooth somehow and uh, add details uh, it, in the process. That seems like what you're doing with like those train figures you showed, like with that with that tank where it was smoothed. Seems like that's what you did to smooth out the, the effect of tacitly. That's what it looks like. like oh, th that might be a. Uh, an effect that you perceive because of the displacement, but in this case, we didn't combine with... I know, uh, yeah, that's what I mean, the display. I think you, I presume you probably baked that smoothing into the displacement. Uh, 
that, that wasn't the case in, oh. in the examples we showed. But we want to do that because there are cases where it's important to do it. To, otherwise, there are artifacts that appear. But actually, in practice, in those examples, that, that was never the case. Huh. <laughs> Good. Who wants the cube next? There's somebody here, please. Yeah, hi, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, it's just like some meta question, like you gave examples uh, of how level of details can help for say shape and materials. What about illumination? Do you have any examples uh, where level of details can help for illumination modeling as well? Absolutely, actually with uh, Tobias and Elma, we've been working on that 10, 12 years ago maybe. Uh, Maybe you're familiar with the notion of light cuts uh, or, or VPLs. Um, th this is a way of modeling explicitly lighting in a, in a 3D scene and first bounds, for instance, for indirect lighting. And uh, we, we actually worked on that with Tobias. He was the, one of the main authors of a paper called Many LODs, where the idea was essentially to build a lot of level of details at once when shading a scene, a, a, a scene uh, for each uh, shading point. Uh, the idea was to... Uh, expand what's called point-based global illumination into the real-time realm. And that was extremely useful to actually build on the GPU in parallel fast level of details of a uh, point clouds that was essentially here to lit the second bounce, the, the first bounce of indirect lighting. Okay. And there, like that's one example, but uh, th there are many others. Uh, at some point we worked on HDR relighting uh, of, of, re of uh, for uh, augmented reality and actually uh, using a 3D point cloud with HDR colors happened to be uh, the way to go. And it was obviously way too heavy to do that in real time. So we had to actually generate level of details on the fly to relight not from an IBL, but from an actual 3D object. And I could go on for like with 10 other examples. Actually, I didn't talk so much about lighting precisely because this is probably in the lighting world and in the rendering world that level of details have been explored the most over the last few years, in particular when it comes to radiance caching and, and this, this, uh, this line of research. Okay, thanks. Would have time for one short further question. There's none, okay. So, well, there is, okay, sorry very much. Or <laughs> we'll speak up if it's... It's supposed to. Try again. Never mind. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, have you looked into uh, predicting displacement map that can be used to do some like texture um, transfer on different geometries? Predicting displacement map is that yes. what you said? So um, well, we have ongoing projects in this space uh, oh, I see. <laughs> that I can't really, can't really talk about. Uh, but definitely at some point when you see how efficient uh, uh, neural inspired methodologies are with uh, radiance caching or uh, even reflectance caching, uh, we definitely start to look into uh, what this means for the displacement part, the displacement content. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're out of time, I guess. Uh, Let's thank Tommy much, much, much for that. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess there's a coffee session ahead. <laughs>